Hello, and welcome to UO People Meets Alex Berger. UO People Meets is a monthly speaker series in which we host leading and unique individuals who share their passion and inspire with their insights. I'm Pascaline Servan Schreiber, Vice President for Business Development at University of the People. So UO People Meets is uh, 45 minutes. Um, all, all of you are welcome to write in questions in the comment section. And if time permits, they will be answered at the end. Um, as we are on our YouTube channel, you'll be able to watch this again or tell your friends about it. And we are also going to post this event on our UO People Online Career Service Center. And don't forget to like or comment and subscribe to UO People YouTube channel. So it is my great pleasure today to introduce Alex Berger. Alex is a producer, creator, consultant, and entrepreneur in the media field. During his professional life, he created or participated in numerous content creations. Asterix, Mission Cleopatra, which is a very well-known French uh, film, TV shows, Rapido, Burger Quiz, etc. On the digital front, he invented the multi-access portal for Vivendi Vodafone and participated in the growth of several companies, NBDC, Shewam, Canal Plus, Top, the Oligarchs production, by holding various key positions. As president and CEO of the Oligarchs Group and the Oligarchs Productions, he produced the critically and internationally acclaimed show Le Bureau des Légendes, which has been, uh, I think, um, known in other countries as The Bureau, which aired its five seasons on Canal Plus and on Sundance Now in the US. The show sold in 116 countries, and it is one of my favorite TV shows. So Alex, welcome. We're so happy to have you here. And um, tell us, what is it like to be a, a producer of an amazing show? Oh, well, hello, Pascaline. Uh, really great uh, to meet you. Um, I'm very happy to be uh, on this platform. Well, um, it feels great to be doing what I've been doing for the past 40 years, um, which is essentially creating content. And I, I often tell people that what I do for a living is I create brands. I create emotionally engaged brands, um, stuff that you watch to entertain yourself. And I've been fortunate enough to be doing this for such a long time that I've been uh, through various um, different ways of, of developing content and may it be, of course, as Pascaline just said, um, content for traditional TV. And that was 40 years ago, a show that I started doing uh, when I was young and when the motivation was, well, I'm not seeing on TV stuff for people my age in a tone, a rhythm and style that uh, talks to what I was at the time, a young, a young adult. And so I had the good fortune of, well, I, I'm, none of my family was in this business, uh, but uh, uh, I had the good fortune of stumbling into this, this world just because I spoke English and I was living in France and I was working at Tele Monte Carlo, which is a small private television station, the only uh, private television station that at the time in the early 80s was transmitting to France. And uh, I became an intern there over the summer while my all of my French friends were um, still studying at school. Um, and um, all of a sudden, Princess Grace of uh, Monaco died in a car accident. People wanted to, um, well, the... the channel needed to take care of the, the funeral and the whole, uh, uh, everything that was going on with this terrible news in, in the Principality of Monte Carlo. 
And the head of the channel, I was just doing my little things as an intern, came up to me and said, do you, uh, uh, do you know, could you take care or be in charge of uh, the coordination of this world vision of, of the funeral? And I had no clue what he was asking me to do. But I said, sure, uh, not a problem. And I worked uh, essentially for 72 hours nonstop in making, uh, making the broadcast possible, making all the different uh, uh, channels around the world from CNN to ABC, CBS, NBC. I mean, they were all converging on this small part, this small principality in the southeast of France. And... Um, it went smoothly, and I got called up to the office of the chairman, and uh, he said, do you want to be the, the producer of the news, of the news flash, the 6 p.m. news flash? I had no clue again what he was asking me to do, but um, I said, sure. And I learned everything sort of uh, with the people who were there. The, I learned really putting my hands into the motor, really – trying to understand while doing, because uh, there's only so much you can learn in school, but there's nothing better than all of a sudden, you know, jumping into the deep end of the pool. So I did that for a couple of years, moved to Los Angeles to try to be a little bit more ambitious in the type of products that I was doing. I went to LA. I was working with a partner with a friend of mine, and we had a good idea, which was smelling, selling small interstitial uh, parts, so small, short programs, so cable channels could start their movies on time. So anything from five to 10 minutes in length. And so what we did is um, we did a lot of business. It was really cheap. We'd send, sell these things for 50 to $100, but they were literally thousands of channels in the United States. So it became a business. We sold that business. Um, and then uh, I, I came up with an idea for a toy company to use a toy line to produce an animation series. That animation series was the first one of the genre. It was called Robotech. And that sold the world over. And the idea that a brand such as a toy company, Revell Toys, could also become producer and finance original content, which had the dual quality of both putting their brand and their merchandise in front of the public with an emotional engagement. Oh, kids wanted to have that toy because they liked the story that was in the, the cartoon. Um, we sold that company. I came back to Geneva where I became a financier specialized in media and um, entertainment stocks. And I learned two things in Geneva at the bank uh, that I worked for, the Edmund the Rothschild Private Bank. Uh, one is that I didn't want to be a banker, and two, I didn't want to be living in Geneva. So um, very quickly, um, I moved back to Paris. This is mid-'80s. And in the mid-'80s, um, France had uh, essentially – uh, one private channel, which is Canal Plus, which is like HBO, uh, pay a subscription premium channel. And then came a couple of others. And it was a first sort of change of paradigm in the media environment. And so as a young producer, what I was interested in was music and, and everything around young uh, urban culture, etc. And we put together a magazine called Rapido that uh, not only sold uh, in France, but sold to the BBC in the UK on prime time. And so with my partner at the time, uh, Eric, uh, Antoine de Kuhn, we uh, had all of a sudden a franchise in roughly 20 countries around Europe that was selling a news magazine on cultural affairs and essentially a music uh, show. That went very well. Um, the BBC... Uh, was showing the show and it was a huge success. And then we partnered with a media mogul at the time whose name was Richard Branson. He owned Virgin. And at the time he owned mega stores and he owned um, uh, a Virgin Communications. So we did a joint venture with him. And then our company blew up and we had 
literally tens of programs on all of um, the English channels, Channel 4, uh, BBC, ITV, Sky, everything. And so that was great. Um, and I spent a great time in, in sort of understanding the revolutions and evolutions that were going on in making programs that were fitted for a demographic for who we were. And that was always my core criteria, which is I need to really like it. I need to be engaged. And if you really believe in it, if you really have the faith and you really spend the time and energy in catering to what you think is new and different and something that is uh, uh, going to be appealing, um, well, it, it sort of works. That has been my, 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 my way of thinking. And then I came back uh, uh, to France. I um, started working with Canal Plus. Uh, Canal Plus at the time was the biggest uh, uh, premium uh, subscription channel in, in not only in France, but in Western Europe. Um, I started working for the chairman and CEO, Pierre Lescure, and became head of uh, strategy for the whole group. And we grew from essentially a couple of European countries to uh, 14 countries around, around Europe. It was amazing. And then Africa and then uh, other countries around the world. But so I had a great time. And then as Pascaline said, I got into digital. When I got into digital, it was essentially through an idea. And the idea was how can I watch what I like seamlessly between TV, um, telephone, and at the time it was at best 56K, so very slow, and um, the web. And the web, all of this was the early days. And what we did is we created essentially a, a middleware and something application that run on all these devices. And I could watch seamlessly. If I was a subscriber to Canal Plus, I could watch it on my phone, etc. Today, it seems uh, very common, but in, in the 90s and early 90s, it was certainly not, and interactive TV was not, and digital TV was at the beginning. So I did that, and, and, and we grew the company enormously. As, as uh, in the introduction, we, we sold what costed us with really about uh, $500,000 to do, we sold it for, uh, I think it was 30 billion uh, to Vodafone. Um, and then we, I, I was always, while I was doing this, it was always, well, what, these pipes and these apps are all great, but what's really the core of what I know how to do is filling those pipes. What is, what do we put inside? What are we, going to be aggregating our attention on how we're going to spend our personal bandwidth. So I left Canal in 2000 and started um, a few other companies that invested in um, content producing companies and I accelerated their growth and then um, uh, did that for, for until 2008. I met my uh, partner, Eric Rochon, who I, so I did movies. As Pascaline said, we did a half a dozen movies. Uh, some of them are still in the top three uh, 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 gross uh, 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 of the gross of movies. So we did very well in the movies. We did very well with a lot of different playing. I, I played around with a lot of formats, but I did understand that I was left brain and right brain. My mother's an artist. My father was a, an engineer. Um, and my conception, my idea was that you need to invent all the time. You need to be different. So I was always extremely, uh, in a, I was always inventing something. I was always trying to write something. I was trying to find new narratives. And, it, you know, the technology changed all the time, but the narrative, the story is always the same. We're humans and humans love stories. And that's how we uh, strive and survive and, and continue is by not only the entertainment, but also the knowledge that we share through stories. 
And, you know, when you learn, you're telling a story of what, how something works or what a, a service or, or a concept is. So I did that a lot. Um, so uh, my fund, which was called Content Participations, was sold to a bank. And then um, I uh, started really wondering how we as French that had invented uh, a film, uh, how come we were not good or we weren't efficient in exporting and creating um, series or scripted drama uh, for, uh, for the international market. And it was, and we'd, we'd be producing 250 movies in France every year, probably second to the US or third to behind Bollywood. But it was really about how can we be as exigent, as uh, ambitious, as smaller countries that were more efficient in selling. The Scandinavian countries would sell around the world with a lot of their, their shows, Israel, Turkey. Um, and in France, even if we had a huge output, uh, we weren't very good. So Eric Crochon, who was an award-winning director and who we had been, and we'd been working together for a few years, um, we decided to, uh, work on a first project that was called The Oligarchs. And it was about, of course, the, the fall of the Berlin Wall and the rise of these Russian uh, oligarchs and the rise of the extreme capitalism in, in Russia. And that became a model of our ambition. And so we sold it to Canal Plus in France, but we also had to deal with HBO and started to adapt a very sophisticated um, process that exists in the United States that is very, uh, uh, very clearly defined in rules and regulations. I think that the U.S. is by far, except China, probably the most regulated country in terms of media and process. Well, in any case, the U.S. had a fantastic process. And what we did is Eric and I adapted that process to a French or international production based in France. And that was, we, we got in development. We did a lot of work on that. We were nicely paid. And one day, Eric Crochon came to the office and said, I had an idea. It's called the Bureau des Légendes. It's about um, the daily routine of uh, the clandestine operations within the French CIA, so the DGSC. So the daily operations within a, um, uh, an intelligence agency that work on foreign si soils to, to foreign lands to protect uh, the homeland of France. And we pitched that to Canal Plus and we said, you know, here's what we want to do. Here's the concept. Here's our industrial process. If you want the one, you have to buy both. And we said it's a yearly show. It's going to come on every year. Um, we're going to do 10 episodes. And it might seem very common to most of you, but um, at the time, Canal Plus in France did at best eight episodes every 24 to 36 months. And we understood, Eric and I, and the people within our company, that if competition was going to come to France, notably with premium platforms, which it did a few years later with Netflix, Amazon, and now uh, Disney Plus and, and HBO Max and Apple, etc. Well, what we understood at the time is that we needed to uh, take our production value up a couple of notches. And the way to do that for us was if within our process, which is, uh, essentially managing a brand from A to Z, so from development, and that instead of having one or two writers or in a director, which is sort of how uh, it worked in France, the director was king because of a heritage of, as we call, uh, film d'auteur. And, uh, and, and what we did is we changed that. So the director was not uh, the king, it was the writer, or the showrunner, the the, the person who 
wrote and invented the, the series, who was in charge of, of the vision, the creative vision. So it was starting at that level, instead of having one or two or three people, we had 10 people in a writer's room uh, to, to write this series and a lot of, in a structure, a pyramidal structure, very hierarchical um, with uh, people that were senior writers writing episodes under them. They had screenwriters that were juniors who would do research, a huge amount of research. And, and then we had auditors and, and everybody in the back office to take care of this. We also rented studios year, year long and, and therefore we put and implemented this, uh, this way of managing the brand in a different way from conception all the way to delivery. Nothing came out on the Bureau without our hand on it, without our agreement, without our green light. And the result of that has been the biggest success in uh, French um, uh, scripted drama, which is the Bureau. As Pascaline said, we've sold roughly the world over. Um, and that led us into a lot of different formats. But the, at the end of the day, what I do is I do what I want to do. I, I just tell stories. And I That's create fascinating, work. Alex. That's a thank you so much for that for that introduction and and for explaining what what the difference is uh, and what you've been able to bring to this industry. Um, we have a lot of questions and from our from our viewers, and I'd like to, I'd like to, um, they want to get your opinion. They're very, very interested in content crea creation. And um, one, you know, one question is, uh, there, there are actually two questions. Um, how do you start creating content from scratch? And what, and what makes compelling content? Damn, I don't know who, who's asking that question, Pascaline, and where is <laughs> it from? Um, I answer and I'll tell you where there, there, we have, we have students from everywhere. So okay. right now. Well, it's just because the answer really depends who, where you are, where you're asking this question from, but I mean, how do you, you know, how do you have an original idea and having an original idea that transforms itself into something bigger? A story. I mean, what do you want to tell? Um, do you think that the idea is something that can be recurrent? Is it a concept? I, I usually give a formula that Eric Rochon invented, which is um, a scripted drama or a series, is has a very simple equation. It's an idea that becomes a concept. The concept means we, we developed really how this will work for years and years. How do you turn around the core idea without falling into it? So it's something that you can really talk about, people, etc. So an idea, a concept, an environment, and characters. And essentially the characters take over the environment, the concept, and the idea. So the shows, the way to do a scripted drama series is really to, you know, we always say write on what you know, but, you know, uh, I don't know how much um, um, uh, Game of Thrones was so something based on something you know. It's really about understanding and going very deep in describing the idea, the concept, the environment, and the characters. And essentially what you want to do is think of how that works. Now that's scripted drama. For a movie, you have to do the same thing within a 90 or 120 minute uh, 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 time frame. And that is the same way, but it's, it's, you have to uh, work uh, the story in a different way. Uh, in a scripted drama that's recurrent, you know, every at the end of every episode, you want people to come back. You want people to be engaged with the characters. They want to be engaged. They want to feel something. In a movie, it's the same thing. And, you know, the interesting thing today is movies have become more and more big franchises. Um, I mean, the studio movies 
do franchises. You know, and I'm not even going to start on Star Wars or, or Marvel or, or DC, but the idea of finding these characters that you know, that you know what their limitations are or what their flaws are, and you're surprised and interested and engaged in how they're going to move forward. Now, in television, you know, reality TV is scripted. You know, you want to find an environment where the characters are so surreal. If you look at um, the, I don't know what the name is, the wives of New York or whatever, the riches, the life of the rich and famous, wherever it is in the world, or, or whatever reality TV, uh, selling sunset on real estate or stuff like that. What is it? It's plunging into an environment. But there's a concept. We're going to show how complicated that environment is through the characters, and they're very extreme, etc. So again, that formula works. What's the idea? What's the concept? And how can it come back? And then you have, you know, game shows and, and other formats. It all comes down to an idea. And, you know, what is that new vision? What is that new way how are you going to differentiate your idea, your concept uh, uh, from what you've seen and what you, you want to do better? Um, we weren't the first spy show with the Bureau, but we wanted to do something new. And I think that Eric, you know, strived to find a new tone, a new way of telling a story and, and our story and our series, the 50 episodes, are extremely realistic. And his angle was always no fantasy. We're not Homeland. We're not, um, we're not Jack Ryan. It's really about how it really is in a day-to-day -day, uh, business. It's not about James Bond. It's the contrary. How does a guy wake up every morning, go to work, uh, taking the train, and, and can't really tell anything to his family and friends and what he does all day. He can't, it's secret. And he is privy to a lot of serious shit going around in the world. And therefore, you know, how does that work in the psyche of people? So, you know, I've done so many different shows and so many different narratives. It's really about first, oh, I, I have a story I want to tell. I have an idea. And, you know, maybe it's shit. Uh, maybe it's um, been done. So how are you going to think it through again? So, oh, that's been done. Well, what's my differentiation? How can I make my idea original? Um, at, you know, the, Steven Spielberg, you know, always says you should, you should try to, exceed the uh, uh, your inspirations and when he was a kid he went to movies he read comics he read books uh, and when he saw movies he said oh that's such a great movie i have an idea an adventure movie i'd like to do something bigger bolder than i what i saw when i was a kid and you know when he comes up with indiana jones uh, it's amazing but I mean, the examples are, 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 are many. There's no formula. It's really something that you need to be engaged. You need this job is so many jobs. Being an executive producer means you have to know law, finance, uh, marketing, uh, technology, uh, writing. And the writing is the core. I mean, everything is about writing. Writing is at the core of every concept. You write it out and rewrite it out and rewrite it out and rewrite. When you have the hundredth version and it's starting to sound something new and you really have a passion for it, then you can sell it. Then you can start talking about it to people who are in the capacity to make it real. And, you know, that's, that's this business. I, I think that's a very great explanation of what it 
what it takes to create content and your passion is is so apparent and I think is is very inspiring. We have some um, we have a lot of questions about sort of your personal journey and um, there's you know a couple a couple of them about failure. And you know we all have moments when we fail in life and 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 how do you recover? How do you recover from failure? And and maybe we could start by what was what was um, can you tell us about the, some some things that you had to overcome, biggest obstacles that you had to overcome to get to where you are today? And how do you recover from failure? Two very good questions. So um, the obstacles is this is a small world, uh, the world of. Uh, movies, production, television, scripted drama. I mean, whatever it is, the entertainment industry is a, is a relatively small world um, in every country or in every region um, because it's, it's really hard. I didn't come from a family that was in that business at all. And, you know, the hurdles and obstacles – became strengths for me because I uh, was interested. I was fascinated by uh, movies and, and television and, and stories and books and comics and music. And it was just fascinating for me the, the idea that we could have an original idea and it could become something that people – shared or, uh, or became theirs. It, that was a really strong concept. I think since I was six or seven years old, I'd write stories and I tell stories and I try to do things. In any case, the, the first hurdle is you have to be so passionate that you're going to invest your time in understanding what that business is. And I remember looking from the outside in and i at the time i remember there was this uh, this uh, well this news uh, um, magazine still exists today called variety and variety was in english and there was a daily variety and even a weekly variety still exists today but um, the lingo that they used was gibberish to me i mean i the words didn't make any sense. And the companies, and they'd call uh, uh, actors thesps. They'd call uh, 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 networks, whatever, uh, blurbs. I mean, all I needed to understand the culture, the language, the players. And I spent a huge amount of time doing research just to understand, to be at the minimal level of understanding of what this world or these worlds were. And I invested a huge amount of my time because it was, it was just thrilling for me. Then, you know, the other hurdles is you, you, you find an opportunity. I was at school. I was at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, I was, it was, it was summer break. I, you know, decided to intern at a television station. I had done a little bit of TV on, on campus, had met some people at, at, in Philadelphia, et cetera. And all of a sudden it became, I saw it for real. And I said, this is, this is like magic. I, and I started to also spend a huge amount of time trying to understand very quickly what was what, what was a cameraman, what was a producer, what was a script, what was, you know, what was a contract. I, we, you needed, I needed to learn literally everything and I, I was bulimic, uh, totally bulimic on everything I need to learn. So I think that's the investment is just understanding the environment that you think you know, because it's much harder than anything you can imagine. So you have to be prepared and you have to know that minimum knowledge. Now, failures. Failures are the best way to learn. Um, I did a show called the best of the worst. Uh, this is 25 years ago. And the show was about um, huge failures and what positive aspects come out of failures. And we did that show for 
I don't know how many years. It was not a failure. Um, but it was great to hear enormous uh, uh, success, enormously successful businessmen, et cetera. I mean, we talk about the Concorde that was an amazing piece of machinery to New Coke at the time. I mean, things that were gigantic failures. And there's also, there's always a silver lining. And for me, every time that I was rejected because I pitched, I go to a channel or I go to a somebody that I needed to sell to. Um, if they, if I didn't achieve uh, the sale, I was very. I'd analyze for really for hours why, why did he or she not connect with my idea? What did I lack? Did I lack? Sometimes you're too young. You're not backed well. You didn't haven't thought through the things. They're, they, they're, the people in uh, across the room are not prepared to give you a huge amount of money uh, when they don't know. So everything. I mean, the thousands of failures, small and big, make um, make you and and make you understand. And you really have to think and 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 post. You know, it's really post-rationalization. It is about understanding exactly what you do. And the best way of doing that is writing. Every day I write down not only the meeting, I prepare for a meeting, but I do my, my post-mortem. You know, what did go wrong? Where did I think I went wrong? And it, when I was really lucky, you know, I, I'd ask the person, well, the persons that were sitting across from me, um, why did I fail? What 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 wasn't good? And sometimes they were honest. Most of the time they're not. So you need to read people. And I think so. The 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 skill or the superpower that you need to build is not only your self confidence. You need to 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 believe that you have. Uh, the best thing possible that you're selling because that's your strength. That's how you're going to sell it, believe. And then, you know, um, never give up. Just continue, strive. You never give up. I, I was 19 when I dropped out of school. My father and my parents were shocked. And I had no way of going back. I said, oh, I'll go back in a couple of years. And essentially, I just was obsessed. And I went ahead. I looked ahead. I mean, there's a lot of little things. I, the biggest failures for me, you know, and, and other ways. I mean, you work on a movie or a show. I remember a, a movie that we did for Warner Brothers in France that was a really uh, not a huge movie. It was a nice little comedy. But... Um, that didn't go well, and, and you need to metabolize failure. You need to know how to process the fact that nobody loves you, essentially. That's hard. Um, and bigger failures become aren't always failures. Um, I remember a movie that we had produced, uh, also a comedy, after Asterix. It was Asterix we sold... Um, uh, $200 million worth of tickets. So it was a gigantic success. And the movie that came after was called R. It was a really interesting comedy. And I remember the day of the release in France, we had a full page on the most popular newspaper. And it's it, it, it was written dull or nul, or null, really bad. And that was such a shock because it costs a lot of money. And so having a huge newspaper come out saying it was essentially disappointing, but for the whole page. So you, you really have to think, how do you, how do you move on after that? And, we processed it together. We were a whole group of people. We talked it over and 
and obviously there was this one journalist that um, after the huge success of uh, the previous movie just wanted to say, oh, disappointed. And instead of saying it like that, he had this huge uh, first page that was awful. Well, the silver lining is we still did roughly 20 million euros, $20 million worth of ticket sales, which was okay. But not, a, not as much as we thought. We thought we'd do at least the double. But because there was this controversy, uh, we sold, at the time, videotapes. Um, we sold for 40 million of videotapes. And it became a cult movie because of the... The, the 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 lashing out that this uh, that this um, that this uh, journalist had and it was great so we turned and that came very quickly we turned this sort of animosity into a selling point and it became a cult movie for youngsters and they really bought those videotapes and and VOD and 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 rented the movie and it was great so we turned a huge failure which was announced as going to be a, the, one of the biggest failure into essentially a, a success. So never, uh, never sell yourself short. I mean, you know, you need to know when it's over and you need to move on. And you have to also think, well, it's never really over because, you know, uh, when you're creating content, people, it's the people who judge you and you can have, a very shitty critical uh, aspect, but if people come and like it and make it theirs, it's a great success. So you have to analyze that marketing aspect and demographics as much as you can. Well, thank you for, for those examples, which are very candid and, and for being so open about your successes and your and your failures. I mean, I think we all have to face these kinds of these kinds of things. And it's important to learn from others how they do it. So we're coming towards the end of the show. I'm going to ask you one last question, if we can have maybe a short answer. Um, I don't do short answers. All right. Well, looking back, um, are there things that you wish you could have done differently? How do you deal with, do you have regret or how do you deal with, uh, with that? Um, no, I think I was, I'm one of the luckiest people around. I think that, um, I don't regret really anything. I think that, um, uh, the universe is really interesting. Uh, if you believe in karma, if you believe in, in, in forces, I think that, um, first of all, luck my middle name is Luck Chu, um, and that's a, that's a nickname that I was given when I got to France when I was ten years old from the U.S. and in the eastern part of France they nicknamed me Luck, and I think Luck, you know, is about reading uh, the stars, reading feeling. You need to have a gut feeling. Um, I don't regret anything in my existence so far. Um, the choices are mine. I don't know, you know, you, you come to pay if you do uh, things that are not decent. I, I think you need to have morally, I'm good. I, I can look myself, look at my kids, my kids tell stories. I can inspire other people because I am very fortunate. Um, and I hope and I believe that I still have uh, some stories to tell. So, you know, I, I think every morning I meditate with my uh, first and current wife. Um, I uh, listen to my what my, I, I, I listen to the conversations that I have all the time, night and day, um, all the time with, um, with myself. I, when you do, 
when you're a producer, when you're an entrepreneur in this business um, outside of the U.S., we always see these these huge numbers, people that are making gazillions, etc. Um, it's hard, hard work. It's hard work. So what you need to do is just you have to take everything in stride. I'm, I'm so lucky to be able to do this. It's been 40 years. For 40 years, I've been able to do exactly what I wanted to do on my terms. And that is also something very uh, interesting because I don't regret anything because I refuse to do certain shows and you know, that were hugely successful. And I told uh, the, 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 the person who was doing the show, I said, you know, you need to go on by yourself. I don't want to do this. I don't feel comfortable. I'm not the right person for you. I'm not, I'm not the right sparring partner. Go out and do it. And, and a couple of those people, if not all of them, became extremely successful. But I don't regret it. I was part of it. I was there at the beginning or I helped or whatever it is. My, and I benefited in any case. So, no, I don't regret anything. I think that I, I still, uh, I regret, you know, I wish I was, uh, I had more energy, the same energy that I, that I had when I was 21 still today. But at least the experience enables me to cut corners and have other people do things for me. Alex, thank you for these. This is a great way to end uh, to end our, our session today. You know, having no regrets is, um, I think, is a very interesting uh, topic because everything we do is uh, is an opportunity to learn. And our mistakes are, are ways in which we can grow. And, um, and so we can take things and, and, you know, make, we have lemons, we make lemonade, right? Um, so Alex, thank you for, for being so open with, with our viewers and for, and for being so present with us. Um, thank you all of you who've watched us today on YouTube. We hope you enjoyed the presentation and got some inspiration. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of your questions. Uh, you've been a very, very vocal audience with lots of questions, and I apologize we couldn't uh, we couldn't talk to everybody. Um, we will announce our our guest for next month on the Online Service Career Center and on the channel, and we hope to see you again soon on YouTube. Please don't forget to like us and subscribe to UO People's YouTube channel. Um, we'll see you next month. Bye. Take care. Bye.